once you've been to so many crime scenes, it sticks with you, you yeah. know? Um, I have insomnia, terrible insomnia. I'm sure it's from that. Um, I lock all the doors. I still look at my kids to see if they're, sleep if they're breathing, to see if they've been kidnapped. My son's like 6'2". I don't, <laughs> he's 17. I do that. You know, you, you grew up in the Bronx, you know. The in the South Bronx. In the South Bronx. <laughs> The, the era you grew up in, it was a little different than it is today. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you had an incredible career. Yeah. But, but what made you go down that path? Go down that path. Um, you know, for me, it all started, um, I think, when I look back on it, because I've been asked this question, and uh, I saw uh, a tremendous amount of violence, unfortunately, when I was a little girl. And it culminated um, when I was about seven with seeing my uncle stabbed in front of me. And I remember thinking, I don't wanna live this way. And that's a pretty sophisticated thought for a seven-year-old, but I remember thinking that. And um, I also remember feeling very helpless because it was, treated it as if it was no big deal. It, Someone was stabbed and it was no big deal. It was no big deal. Um, it wasn't investigated. The police came and kind of took some notes and left. Um, Presumably it, it was wasn't a big deal prosecuted. For the, it, it was a big deal for the people involved. It, it was. I mean, it changed the trajectory of our family. It was my father's, he was my father's only brother. They were very close. My father's never been the same person. Uh, my grandmother's never been the same person. And uh, my family moved away from the Bronx, from all of my friends, from my father's side of the family. And uh, we never talked about it either. We were a very That's poor crazy. family, so therapy was not even an issue. Right. And I think from that experience, I thought two things. One, I'm not gonna be a defense attorney, I want to prosecute cases, um, and two, people need to talk, and I want to help whichever way that I can and tell stories. And I, th I really think, at the end of the day, criminal law I understood, and I wanted to be on that side of the table. It and really, I could trace it, it back to that. It really is different from a lot of, because a lot of people will feel like they want to defend people, but yes. you was like, no, 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 no. No, no. no. no I didn't. And, you know, I, I think about it now because I was speaking with Kamala Harris. And as a person of color, I get uh, the question all the time, like, how could you be on that side of the table? I think it's really important for prosecutors to be on that side of the table, especially prosecutors of color. Because if you come from that community, you understand the community very, very well. Right. Um, and I always say the prosecutor is the most important person in the courtroom because we have the most power. We have the power to decide if a case gets brought or not. Right. You have the power um, to determine whether or not someone's freedom is at issue. And there were some cases that I did not prosecute. I remember we had Meek Mill on The View. Oh, and no they, kidding, because you have yes. a 100% record, but it never occurred to me that there were some cases where you're like, oh no, I shouldn't. No, and most of the cases that I did not bring were because I questioned how the process happened. I questioned police brutality. I questioned why their, uh, the mugshots had uh, the defendants had black eyes. And most of the time, wow. those cases had confessions attached to them. Right. I questioned drug rates. I questioned those cases. And we had Meek Mill on our show, and he, his mugshot was shown um, on our backdrop, and I said, what happened to your face? And he said that I was the first person that had asked that in 20 years. And I said, the prosecutor didn't ask that? He said no. And he said he was the, uh, you know, it was beaten out of him, whatever he said to the police. Right. And so that's why it's so important to have someone like me on that side of the table. 
Wow, that, that, that never occurred to me. Yeah, <laughs> never it occurred doesn't to occur me. to many people. No. Yeah. Um, so, so then fast forward, you had this amazing career. You, yeah. as I said, you've, you never lost a case. Not one. You picked the ones <laughs> you were going after and then yeah. they went to jail. Yeah. Then you said, I don't want to do that. And what, you, you know, so yeah. we need people like you. Yeah. And you just said, no, I don't want to do that anymore. Well, what happened? Um, if I'm being honest, is that uh, as I got more and more invested in my career at, at the Department of Justice, the cases became more and more complex. Yeah. I had more and more responsibility. I started doing gang prosecutions. Yeah. Um, I was pregnant and I started getting death threats. <sighs> and uh, one in particular kind of shook me up. I was a, a gang prosecution and as I was walking out of the courtroom and through the well, uh, these gang members started kind of sing-songing, dead woman walking. And I was pregnant. And uh, I reported it to the marshal service, and then we had like marshals and agents stationed outside of my home throughout the trial. And my husband kind of turned to me and said, really, is this what we're gonna do? And uh, wow. I kind of said, yeah, this is what we're gonna do. But <laughs> um, he's still married to him. So. We're still married, 21 years. Um, but when we moved to New York, because I wanted to move closer to my family um, uh, for my children, I was going to transfer to the U.S. Attorney's Office here in New York, and um, I wanted to stay home with the kids. I did, and um, that lasted for maybe uh, six months. Then I started driving everybody <laughs> crazy. Um, and I did get an offer to transfer, but my heart wasn't necessarily in it anymore. And I, I decided to, to switch off and, and practice securities litigation, something that um, I just felt was almost safer yeah. um, and wouldn't, because when you're a prosecutor, when you're practicing criminal law, you must be all in. And I'm always all in no matter what I do. Right. And um, I was an all-in mom, and I needed to do that. Yeah, it's not, yeah. It, yeah. I'm still an all-in mom, ask my kids. I don't know that they like it that much, <laughs> actually. <laughs> um, so, you know, then, and I assume there was some overlap there because you started being a spokesperson and sort of on yeah. some of these shows, and then sort of you slowly, you've morphed into Slowly, this, yes, into yeah. sort of one went down and the other went up. Because you can't do both really, really well. You can't do both all in. You can't be a lawyer and be a journalist at the same time and do them both well. I don't think. Maybe there's someone that can. I couldn't. Right. And so now you've sort of made this transition into this journalist, media personality, strong woman on The View, doing all of these sort of, you know, what does the law say and what should we do next? Yeah. Do you still have the goals? Do you have like a mission you're on? Do you, what is mm. the, what, you know, where, where are you, where's um, Sunny trying to go now? Well, um, I, I never imagined this for myself, actually, because yeah. when I was growing up, um, I, I had a, a journalism, I have a journalism degree, but there was no Oprah when I was, I don't want to age myself, <laughs> um, but there wasn't anyone that looked like me. So yeah. this is, sort of uncharted territory for me. I would never imagine that Barbara Walters would give me this seat at the table. So I think now is my turn to um, provide opportunities for other people. Um, and I've been able to do that with this new show, Truth About Murder, but I was at, um, I don't want to name drop, but uh, I was at Tyler Perry's um, the opening of his studios. Yes. I've never seen anything like this in my life. Well, I saw you talking about it on another talk On show. Jimmy Kimmel. Yeah. I mean, just the invitation was like an iPad with a personal invitation video. Um, but uh, T.D. Jakes um, spoke on Sunday and he said that Tyler Perry had this door opened for him and then turned it over and made it into a platform for other people. And to the extent that I can do that, I would like to do that because I've had this incredible door open for me and over and over and over again. And I really believe that you can't really live a perfect day without doing something for someone who can't repay you. And for those little girls from the Bronx or wherever, from impoverished backgrounds like myself, um, that can now look to me and say that it's possible, maybe in some way I can 
turn over the door and have them walk through it. So I, I think that's what's next. I've started a production company. I have two books coming out um, in 2020, and I, I think that's where it goes. Nice. That's I, the third I act. I think. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the new show, The Truth About Murder. Yes. Um, uh, what got you excited about it? Why did you choose this show? You yeah. must have lots of things that are coming at you. Yeah, you know. I, I, I've had um, lots of opportunities to do this true crime uh, because people love true crime, yeah. especially women. It's like 70%. The yeah. audience is like 70% women. So that's a question. So let's just go through straight there for a second like because crazy. the crimes are all by men and the audience is all women. All women. What's up with that? Like the Views audience, actually. It's yeah. predominantly women no, no, as well. No, 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 it's true. Of watch too. Um, and my I wife, think she saw the episode, she loves it, and she's also, she's she's true follows crime. a podcast about it. She's like... It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. Um, I get a little creeped out by true crime because I've lived it, right? Yeah. And um, once you sort of know how the sausage is made, you don't eat sausage. Um, <laughs> for me, I think women like it for a couple of reasons, and there have been studies on it. I, I think it's a fear of crime because men are committing the majority of these murders, yep. and women are generally the folks that are being murdered, unfortunately. And women are murdered by those that they think love them. Yeah. Um, and so I think women are watching because um, they want to, they have fear of of crime and they want to understand why this is happening and what's happening to them, it's their, their community. I think the other reason is um, they are allowed to be vulnerable while, while they are watching and they're allowed to un feel this fear and, and try to understand it. While being in a safe place. While being in a safe place. Right. She's saying, yeah, <laughs> that's one of the reasons. I think the other reason is the armchair detective, let me figured this out and it's not gonna happen to me. So in that sense, it's empowering. Um, and then I think part of it is, um, it's a little voyeuristic in a sense. There's a little bit of that as well. Um, I, I, my show is different in the sense that I w will never exploit anyone's pain. Um, and so for me, I wanted to address all of those other issues. like allow people to be vulnerable, allow um, that fear of crime and, and give people takeaways so that they can learn from it. Um, but I also wanted to empower women. Um, I wanted to shine a light on the victims yeah. because there are so many of those shows with inside the mind of the serial killer. It's important to understand that. But for me, it was much more important to explore a journey like my journey. What happens to a family when someone is victimized? What happens to the best friend who lost the one person that they could call in the middle of the night? It's no longer there, right. that void. What happens yeah. to a community? Um, and ID, who came to me and wanted me to do something, I said, well, I'm not gonna do what everybody else does. I wanna do this. And they said, we're all in which was kind of shocking to me actually, because you know there's a formula to this. There, there's right. a formula to everything being su successful. And then I also added, and by the way, I want to highlight cases that aren't famous, that nobody's ever heard of. Right. And they kind of looked at me. They said, we're still in. And then I said, and. and that's, that's, that, that's true, right? So none of the, I've only seen the one episode. No, and you it haven't wasn't heard of these yeah. folks. But isn't that what's important? Yeah. Because this could happen to any family. And then finally well, I said, like, your uncle. like my uncle, and I said, and I would like to focus on it's the single mom. Um, I want to focus on people of color. I want to focus on the LGBTQ plus community. Those people that are marginalized where people don't tell those stories. And they still said, we're all in. And I, 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 I hoped that people would respond to it. I yeah. wasn't sure. But we aired October 22nd, and it was the number two show on all of cable news. On all of cable news. Thank you. As I was learning more about you for before this interview, I found out that you're not really sunny. I am not. You're not an imposter, but you're not sunny. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> yeah, um, talk to us about how that happened and yeah. why and how you feel about it. I know. My real name is Asuncion. It's a beautiful name. Thank you. And um, Asuncion, I can say Asuncion. Asuncion, yes. Most people can't for some reason or won't try, I guess. And um, 
my husband calls me Asuncion, my family calls me Asuncion, my friends up until I would say college call me that. My college friends got lazy and when I started on Court TV, I was on with Nancy Grace and she could not pronounce it for anything. Really? For anything. And uh, at the break, she said, can I say something to you? And I said, sure. And uh, she said, what's with the name? You know, and I said, well, my mom's from Puerto Rico and it's a family name. It was named after my grandmother's sister. Um, and it's, you know, it's an important name. It's an old fashioned name. And she yeah. said, nobody can pronounce it. No one can remember it. And you know, she convinced me that I was gonna have a long career in television and that uh, it just wouldn't have longevity and asked me, and this is all during a break, and she said, uh, do you have a <laughs> so nickname? Two and a half minutes or something. Right, and I said, uh, my, my fr a lot of my friends call me Sonny. And she said, that's it, change the Chiron. And, oh my uh, God, live in the break. Yes, and before I knew it, it said Sonny Hostin. And I, I just allowed it so to you, happen. You didn't really, you weren't really in control of that moment. I was. And I could have said, no, that's not my name. But I was thrilled for the opportunity to sit with Nancy Grace. Yeah. Um, because I always think I have agency. We all have agency over ourselves. But um, I let it happen. Yeah. And I became kind of popular under Sonny Hostin. And I just let it happen. And I'll never forget, my grandmother was Furious. <laughs> Furious because everyone was watching. And literally, you know, she was like, Sony, queso, Sony. And I was like, oh, it's just like a TV thing. It's just like my TV name. And, you know, to the day she died, people would call the house because she lived with us. And uh, they'd say, hey, Sunny Home, no, I Sony Aki. And it was like a really big deal. <laughs> she answers my phone and says that I'm not there. Um, and to be honest with you, and, and actually recently, not recently, but like a year ago or two years ago, Anna Navarro, um, who's one of our, our guest co hosts, uh, heard me speaking Spanish in my dressing room and she like peered in to see who it was and I'm like hey and she's like I gotta tell you I thought you were one of these fake Latinas and I'm like what are you talking about <laughs> and uh, we had this long conversation about it and I said my real name is Asuncion my my Catholic name my middle name is Providencia I'm like as Puerto Besa de Cummings I'm like as Puerto Rican as you get it and, um, and I explained to her about my name, and, and in that moment, I realized that I sort of ripped myself from my um, identifiable heritage, and I shouldn't have done that. Right. And I, I, I regret it, but it's like 15 years later. I'm would you, a known quantity. Would you have, if that happened to you again? It would never happen. You know, now a lot of the articles will say Asuncion and then middle, you know, in quotation, Sunny. Sunny Hostin. And I've insisted on that over and over again, just to give homage to that, because yeah, I yeah. do think it's important. And, you know, my daughter's name is Paloma. My son's name is Gabriel. My daughter's name is Paloma, Paloma too. Paloma, right. <laughs> you know, I think that is important. And I, I screwed up. I did. Yeah. I, I'm not convinced <laughs> that you screwed up, really. Mm, but you know. <laughs> um, So... You worked at Fox when Roger Ailes was in full swing. Yeah. You seem to have survived. I did. Uh, yeah. Anything happened there or anywhere else where you felt because of your ethnicity or your gender that you were put into situations where you're like, that's just not fair. That shouldn't have happened. Do you, or have you always been so strong and powerful you've just gone straight through it? No. Um, at Fox, you know, I was definitely one of the lone voices, uh, and I, I actually had a segment called Is It Legal, opposite Megyn Kelly, right. uh, on the O'Reilly Factor, and we sort of cultivated that, the two of us, and then uh, Megyn got her own show, and then I was with um, Lise Wheel. Um, so I, I was okay there. I, I, 
I, I guess I'm not the person that you sexually harass, right? I'm sort of the squeaky wheel. <laughs> or maybe, I don't know why I wasn't, but I'm just, I wasn't subjected to that there. Yeah. Um, but I will say, be, when I was at the Justice Department, I will never forget, I wanted that job more than anything. I was with the antitrust division, and I, but I wanted to be in the courtroom. And uh, I finally got my, my interview through the honors program. And I wore a pantsuit because I, and it was a sharp pantsuit too. It was wonderful. It was what I could afford at the time. I went to Ann Taylor. It was like a houndstooth suit, uh, black and white. And I went into the front office and uh, they called me, this woman, Deborah Long Doyle, calls me in and she said, you cannot wear that. And I was uh, about to interview with John Fisher, who was the chief of the appellate division. And uh, I said, wear what? And she said, the pantsuit. Uh, I said, is there something wrong with it? And she said, you're about to interview with uh, John Fisher. He's old school, white male, and he will not hire a lady prosecutor. He doesn't want to hire a lady prosecutor at all, but certainly not one in a pantsuit from New York City. You're kidding. No. And she said, we're about the same size. I will give you my skirt and you give me your pants. And I said, no, <laughs> I will not do that. And she said, do you want this job? And I wanted the job. Oh my God. And I took the skirt. You did? Yes, I did. Um, and I interviewed and I got the job. And in retrospect, would I do it again? Yes, I would because I got the job and I did good work. And I do not believe I would have gotten the job if, had I worn that houndstooth suit because that was his problem and not mine. Right. Um, I hope that women today, and this was 1995, I hope that women today don't suffer that, but I think they probably do in other ways. There's a couple of things that I immediately think about that. First of all, if I was asked to change trousers <laughs> with another guy, <laughs> I'd fail the it's interview. Crazy. I'd be completely uncomfortable. It's not going to happen. It's crazy. And second, yeah. the guy probably wouldn't offer me. So there was an agency <laughs> between you and the woman was who was wonderful. like, she was really trying to help you. It was wonderful. Um, and she did. But sad that but that's so what it came to. Yeah. Yeah. Because, and you couldn't in those days, in the good old days, right? I sound like uh, <laughs> uh, you could not try a jury. You couldn't try a jury trial uh, in a pantsuit in front of a DC federal jury. Not no, allowed? No way. No way. Wow. Not as a woman of color and not as a woman with a New York accent. Wow. No way. That's just. Um, there weren't any of us there doing wow. it. Wow. Wow. Impossible. Um, so when uh, sort of going on to sort of questions, uh, uh, advice rather. So uh, you know, when, when a woman or a, or a person of a certain ethnic ethnicity sees themselves in uh, a compromised situation, is there any generic advice you can give them or is sort of every situation so unique that you can't do that? Um, I think every situation is unique to a certain degree, like the pants, situation yeah, is unique, unique. right? <laughs> Changing my name is unique as well. Yeah. But I think the generic piece of advice is to, st you have to stay true to who you are, be authentic, and only do exactly what you are comfortable with doing. You always have the agency. Right. Um, you know, I've made choices in my career. Um, that I can live with. The, the decision to change my name was a bad decision. Um, but the decision to put the skirt on was a good decision for me at that time. Um, but I, I always think that you have the agency and you must maintain that. Um, and really never compromise your s value set, ever. Do you feel that's got easier over time or is it getting, I mean, so you see for women in general? For women in general. Mm. Or is it the same or is it getting worse? I have so many mentees now and I, I seek them out and they seek me out. Um, what I have seen, especially with the Me Too movement and the Time's Up movement, I've seen this incredible um, 
strength in numbers. Like what, what, you, what I've right. explained with Deborah Long Doyle, you know, where we had that moment between us uh, that she was there for me. Right. I now see it in mass. Right. And um, I think that le is leading to change uh, because there are more of us in the workplace yeah. um, and we are supporting each other. And I think that is leading to more and more change. Sharing information. I think it's so important to share information. Uh, a quick anecdotal story. When I first joined The View, they gave me a package, a contract, and I was like, this looks great. I was like so ready to sign it. Um, and then I get a call from Sherry Shepard on my cell phone. I was like, how did Sherry Shepard smile? Hey, Sherry! You know, it was like unbelievable. Um, and she said, I heard you're going to join the cast of The View. And I said, yes. And I'm just so thrilled. And she said, did you get your paperwork and everything? And I said, I sure did. And she said, let me go through with you my salary history at The View. And I said, excuse me? And she said, yeah, I was there for seven years. Did they offer you a car stipend? I was like, they sure didn't, Sherry <laughs> Shepard. <laughs> and literally, she she explained the culture. She explained what the package should look like. She explained what I should ask for. Um, she explained what, it, what the hours were really like. Um, and I think women need to do that for each other more. Yeah. Um, I know we're not supposed to talk about work culture and salary packages. Um, it's not illegal. Yeah. And we don't do that yeah. enough. We need to share information. Yeah with each other. It's important to remember that the people in power have all of that information. They have about all everything. of that information and we don't share it. And right. to be clear, a lot of people do share it, but for some reason women don't. There have been studies on it. So, bless you. Um, so my, my advice would be talk to one another. Share the information. Sonny Hostin, thank you so much for oh. spending time. Ascension no, Yes, <laughs> gracias. Mil gracias. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.